All right, I'd like to call this meeting of the Urbana City Council to order for Monday, February 4th, 2019. Will the clerk please call the roll? City Council Members Hazen. Here. Hersey. Here. Brown. Here. I got it out of order, sorry. Mm -hmm. Jacobson. Here. Miller. Here. <laughs> Roberts. Here. And Wu. Here. Mayor Marlin and I are here. Staying. And just for the record, Mr. Miller is attending electronically. Approval of minutes from the previous meeting. We have January 22nd, 2019. Um, the regular, the meeting, the public hearing, as well as a special meeting. Are there, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Moved by er Dennis, seconded by Eric. Any corrections? No, I didn't see any. Okay. Well, the, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. Are there any additions to the agenda? Okay. Public input. I have one card from Eldris Melinda Carr. Doesn't wish to address members, but wants to express continued concerns about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer issues, equity, and historical impact. Next up is unfinished business. There is none. Reports of standing committee. Council member Dennis Roberts. Right. So coming from the um, Committee of the Whole, we have two items. First is ordinance number 2019-01-012, an ordinance vacating portions of certain streets, and these include Orchard Street between Church Street and University Avenue, and Park Street between Orchard Street and McCullough Street. This is on the Carl Hospital campus. And I do have a slight um, uh, uh, a correction? Change in, a correction in the wording, which we'll come to. So, I, so I, what I'm doing is, pass, I, I would like to then bring forward for approval to the City Council um, this ordinance with the approved correction. Okay. Of and that language change is, um, the ordinance is passed by affirmative vote being called of three-fourths of all the corporate authorities then holding office, six of eight votes. So it just changes the number of votes required. Very good. That's good clarification. I'll second. Actually, it's two thirds. Two thirds of the roll call vote. Okay. So it was moved by Dennis, seconded by Bill. Any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Hazen? Yes. Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. Wu? Yes. Mayor Marlin? Yes. That passes with eight votes. Next is Resolution 2019-01-002-R. It's a resolution regarding the release of certain closed session minutes and approving the destruction of certain verbatim item records of closed session minutes meetings for the period ending January 31st, 2019. For the Committee of the Whole, I move approval. Second. Moved by Dennis, seconded by Eric. Any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Hazen? Yes. Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. And that's the end of those things that are coming from the Committee of the Whole. Thank you. Uh, next item is reports of special committees. Seeing none, reports of officers. We have a staff report on the UPTV. As the staff members take their place at the at the table for the presentation, I, I just want to I just want to frame this um, presentation tonight in the context of the financial forecast that that we had presented um, a week or two ago, and uh, what we spoke to you about at that time that you know for uh, our that that we have the structural deficit that we need to resolve, and in the case of UP, UPTV, there are rising costs associated with the, the um, activities there um, and, and we don't have the capacity to absorb those costs. So what we, had, uh, what we had said we were exploring in terms of resolving the budget deficit overall is reducing expenses in some cases and then looking for alternative methods of delivering services in other cases. And that's really what the proposal is um, that we want to present tonight, which is exploring a different way to deliver public access television to the citizens of Urbana. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Sanford Hess. Thank you. And I'm going to just speak for a moment. As the IT director, I do have oversight responsibility for UPTV. So I've been part of this process. So I'm just going to introduce Jason, however, who's going to give you the details. Uh, the memo that we wrote, we wanted to introduce the strategy that we've been discussing. We wanted to present that, get feedback, answer questions about it up front. Um, Jake will be initiating the first step in this process. He will be moving to a part-time status, well, technically retiring and, and returning to us in a new role that we're calling the program coordinator, and that will happen in February. And then Jason, just Mr. Liggett here, will be providing operational management on a day-by-day -day basis for the interim. As we move forward, the future organizational structure will be determined based on the needs of the city and the necessary approvals. But for now, as you all know, Jason has, has been part of UPTV for um, longer than any of us and has the best grasp on all the details. And so he'll be presenting uh, to you now. Thank you, Sanford. Good evening, Council. Good evening. So UPTV really has three main branches of programs and services that we provide in government, education, and public access. You're obviously familiar with some aspects of the government access as we provide audiovisual support for city meetings, including the city council meeting. We also provide um, audiovisual support for a number of other governmental body meetings as well, uh, AV services for city events and department productions, and then we are the staff support to the UPTV Commission too. We cover 14 council boards and commission meetings on a monthly basis. Uh, we're fortunate to have a wonderfully and talented part-time staff of camera operators that run the AV for these. Uh, we pay them a stipend of $29 a meeting. Full-time staff also spend some time setting up for the meetings as far as equipment, producing the lower third graphics for the meetings. And then after the meetings, we also spend some additional time posting those uh, meeting videos to the web, and then Jake spends some time uh, producing a rebroadcast schedule for those meetings. Uh, in addition to covering board meetings, we also work with departments around the city to produce informational and promotional videos. Uh, some of these videos that you may be familiar with, the uh, traffic stop video that we produced with the Human Relations Office and the Urbana Police Department this past year. The videos featured in the city's e-newsletter. It's all about you on a monthly basis are produced by UPTV staff and monthly features on local artists with the Urbana Arts and Culture Program. UPTV provides uh, production services uh, and some AV to support to uh, other governmental bodies as I previously mentioned. Those include the Urbana School District Board of Education, the uh, Champaign County Regional Planning Commission, the Urbana Free Library, the Urbana Park District, and the Housing Authority of Champaign County. Uh, we also serve as Urbana's education access channel. Uh, I've worked very closely with the school district over the years, uh, working with the Urbana Middle School after school program. We've also worked with the Urbana Park District summer camp program uh, a number of times as well. Uh, as you can imagine, our broadcasts of uh, Urbana High School graduation ceremony is, are always popular, as well as the eighth grade promotion ceremony from Urbana Middle School. Um, I work with students in the journalism class at Urbana High School. I've been doing that for a number of years to produce weekly broadcasts of Urbana High School sporting events. And they are also uh, a part of the broadcast team that uh, produce the bi-monthly Board of Education meetings that we mentioned. Public access is the third branch of programs and services offered by UPTV in the city. Uh, staff operates cameras and audio equipment when UPTV members uh, come and produce studio shows. We also provide video production training to UPTV members and we loan out cameras uh, for those members uh, to use. In addition, Jake downloads and schedules third-party shows from non-local producers to fill out a schedule and add a little bit of variety to it. Currently, we do not charge local UPTV members for use of studio time, uh, training, or to borrow that equipment. It's a free service provided by the city of Urbana. 
We do collect $100 annually for UPTV members living outside the state of Illinois. So if you live anywhere within the state of Illinois, it's a free service provided with, by the city of Urbana. If you live outside state boundaries, uh, it's a $100 fee that they pay to the city on an annual basis. Looking at the funding sources from last fiscal year, you can see that our membership fees as well as our paid production services and our underwriting sponsorships uh, were minimal. Uh, the remainder of our funding comes from revenues from cable companies, which is declining as staff costs increase. Uh, part of that to do, as you read in the memo, people are viewing video in different manners now. They're not necessarily viewing it on the traditional television uh, Dish and DirecTV has gotten better over the years. There's Hulu now, there's YouTube, there's Netflix, there's a number of other ways that people are watching video rather than just the traditional uh, cable television model uh, that we've been you know, fortunate to have for years. As uh, Carol mentioned, this isn't quite a sustainable service that the city can continue to offer. We've developed a plan to research the feasibility of launching a fifth PEG channel, and that fifth PEG channel would be managed by a separate organization other than the city. The city would continue to operate a government and education access channel, but the public access portion would go to this fifth channel and whatever organization would be running that. We really think that this would allow public access, not only to continue in Urbana, which certainly, you know, Jake and I have loved bringing those services as one of the fun aspects of our job. Um, we don't think it would just continue, but we really think it would, would thrive if there's an organization focused on that mission. So much of our time is, oh, I've got to run here and do this, I've got to run here and do this, I've got to run here. It's really scattered that we can't focus on that one mission. So by bringing in uh, another organization to run this fifth channel and to uh, continue with public access in Urbana we really think would be a very strong partnership for this community. Um, you know this is kind of the first action uh, from UPTV in following the city's footsteps and creating a foundation for the future and Jake Sanford and I are happy to answer any of the questions that you might have at this time. Questions? Bill. Um, so we have an advisory commission that you guys work with. Have they been presented with this, or are they going to have some input on it? They're absolutely going to have some input. So uh, previous to the council receiving this memo, we sent this memo to the UPTV commission. Uh, we mentioned that tonight we'd be presenting it before the council, and if they had any questions, you know, feel free to contact us, as, as is always the case with the commission. We will be looking at uh, this on, at the commission meeting. Their next commission meeting is the second Friday in March, but then beyond that as well, uh, going through the timeline, they're going to be an integral part in this uh, as they are not only represent a number of the governmental bodies that we work with, but they have direct ties to the community as well. And then um, just one more for now. Um, so does the park district and school district contribute at all to our costs? Financially, they're not. I'm going to go back to that side for a second just so I can kind of run down. Uh, financially, they are not, we are not reimbursed by the Urbana School District or the Urbana Park District. When I first came on board, the Board of Education had been here for years. Uh, you know, we just, that was one of the first meetings that UPTV started broadcasting back in the 90s and it just wasn't put in place uh, any sort of intergovernmental agreement with them. Uh, the uh, library, park district, and housing authority have all been added since I've been here. They're certainly a, a very valued community service in us broadcasting those. At the times that we added those, uh, those were kind of assigned to, assigned to UPTV staff from above. They're all kind of, uh, you know, one, one situation would pop up at the library and they say, oh, you got to go film their board meetings. One po situation would pop up at the park district, oh, you got to go film those board meetings. And we, we really do, you know, uh, hear from the community that it is a valued service in those. Uh, the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission, we have done a number of paid production services with over the years. When their communications director left a couple years ago, they approached us about uh, paying us uh, to provide AV support for their meeting, so we did that. One thing that we've talked about in the last couple of years is working on intergovernmental agreements 
that get the rest of these entities on board at a similar rate to the Champaign County Regional Planning Commission. And then these costs, are they uh, labor only? Or are they, I guess you might, I think other agencies sometimes call them fully burden costs if you include labor and materials and figure out how much we're, we're going to have to replace equipment and all that. What, what actually goes into this cost figure? Yeah, so these are the, the fully burned, burdened costs. Um, they are on the city's schedule of fees. So you see these every year uh, when Beth Beatty comes and presents the schedules of fees. It's $50 an hour. Um, and with this particular scenario, we're figuring two and a half hours per meeting. Uh, and that's where you get these rates from. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Charisse. Yeah. Um, could you uh, explain, please give me more detail on, about the fifth, um, the, the fifth channel? Um, I don't under, I didn't understand that while I was reading the memo. Yeah. So in 1995, the two cities of Champaign and Urbana entered an agreement with the cable company at that time, uh, which was Time Warner. It's since been bought out by Insight and and now Comcast. Mm -hmm. And in this franchise agreement, it allowed those cable companies to use the city's right of way and provide cable service. At that time, it was just cable. Now it's cable, internet, and tele and uh, cable internet. Well, not satellite. Cable internet and uh, okay. internet. Oh, cable internet and phone. Sorry. Okay. Uh, to to the community through that agreement, we collect uh, a number of fees and funds, but we also got four peg channels for the community. What's a PEG channel? It's Public Education and Government Access okay. is what it stands for, P-E-G. Uh, those are divided up. The two cities each took one. Urbana took a PEG channel. Champaign took a PEG channel. And then we offered a PEG channel to the University of Illinois, which is uh, UI7. Mm -hmm. They operate that. And Parkland College operates another PEG channel. Okay. Uh, through the years, we learned that the community wanted a public access portion to PEG and not just government access. So the city of Urbana decided to provide their cable channel as a public access outlet as well as education and government access. Okay. When we renegotiated the franchise in 2010, one of the key renegoti renegotiation points for the city of Urbana was to have the option to launch a fifth channel. And at that time, that fifth channel would be used for a standalone public access channel. And that's what we're proposing right now, is that we launch that fifth channel. OK, so what would be the cost of launching? Is there a cost, I should ask, of launching that, that fifth channel? Yeah, so as far as uh, launching it on Comcast and the other uh, cable providers, we have to cover any cost that it would take necessarily to um, run any fiber or fiber feeds or anything like that. We are fortunate that. In our Comcast agreement, we already have a couple facility addresses that they already have fiber to. One is this, and that's why we're able to run UPTV for. Mm -hmm. The other one is at 205 North Race, which is the board of where the Board of Education meets the central office. Uh, so to save costs in that with our conversations Comcast in the past, we would actually have the, the UPTV or the public access, whatever the channel would be named, mm -hmm. head end right there. And then we would just be uh, responsible for covering the costs of any of the transmitters. It would be probably around $5,000, assuming that the city would donate some of the unused, the, the equipment used now for public access we wouldn't necessarily have a need for that, or we would be upgrading equipment in the near future. So we would say, hey, go ahead and take that off our hands. We do that in a similar fashion now when equip, you know, the old council chamber cameras, once we got done with them and used them and used them and used them, we sent those to the Board of Education. Uh, and the Park District has a couple of our old cameras as well and an old video switcher. So it's a common practice. Uh, it, we really get the, get our money's worth out of our equipment. I so by the, so. by the time we get our <laughs> money's worth, there's not uh, a very large third market for the equipment because uh, technology is already advanced. So we, we tend to donate those to other, other entities. OK, one more question. Um, um, you said that, the, that you're going to get rid of something and get the fifth channel up. I think that's what you're saying. And you're going to have some, another entity run 
the other four? Is it? No. No. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. In this scenario, there's only two channels that are kind of in this conversation. There is the city's channel, mm -hmm. which right now broadcasts public education and government. It's going to drop back to just broadcasting education and government. Okay. The fifth channel, the city would then move the public access portion to the fifth channel. So the fifth channel is only broadcasting public access and the separate entity or organization would run that fifth channel. Parkland would still keep their channel, Champaign would still keep their channel, the university would still keep their channel. This would be a brand new channel that a separate organization would run. Okay, and would there be any cost for that separate organization to run? Yeah, so there's a number of models. We're, we're kind of fortunate, and UPTV in the city is unique, that we put all, of our, all these efforts into public education and government access on one channel. Most cities don't do that. In most other cities, it's ran by a nonprofit organization or a media center or a library, someone separate from the city. So we're going to uh, explore options that other cities have gone through mm -hmm. in that scenario. We don't necessarily have to provide any funding for that. Would there be costs? It, it, it's kind of up to that organization. That's one thing that we'll have a better understanding for in the next five or six months as we continue this research and bring you forth uh, additional information. Okay, Doc. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Alice and then Eric. So if I understand correctly, um, one uh, there's an additional component to this, which is the retirement. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, and then um, since you'll be taking on some of the duties and you'll be coming back as a part-time employee to reduce the load and to um, not increase the needs we have for staffing, you would be reducing that component, that public education component, and handing it over. Is that correct? Is that a correct summarization? So we would be not having two salaries, um, permanent salaries, I guess. We'll have hourly workers and so forth. I'm hoping that you still have at least one permanent <laughs> no, salary. No, 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 no. Let me <laughs> go from two to one. <laughs> I, no, no, no. Correct. correct. Uh, the plan is to go from two, two full-time yeah. salaries to one full-time salary. As you look down that proposed timeline, what will happen um, in 2020 or 2021, I can't remember the very last date there, um, but I will continue as a city employee to run the city's government and education channel as a full-time employee. And then uh, the program coordinator position would leave <laughs> when we launched that fifth channel and the separate organization took over that. So that's a reoccurring cost on, on our budget, basically. So what is the cost savings for that? The cost savings in eliminating one full-time position? Or yes. The well, I mean, you're, you're balancing it, right, with a part-time position and one full-time position, but the, the full-time position comes with benefits and et cetera. So I'm just curious, what is that reduction? Do we have an exact number on that? We don't have an exact number. Once we go through the budgeting, process, which will start very soon, and we get New Year numbers, then we'll be able to calculate that. Okay. Um, it, I, I, I would say this, it's, it's not about the cost savings. I mean, it's not going to be so significant that it's going to solve any problems. Immediate. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it will be a small benefit, but it, it, won't, it, won't, it won't be a, a It won't bullet. fix the structural deficit? It won't fix the structural okay. deficit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Eric. Uh, have you, have you uh, considered thinking about following the cable to streaming transition with our business model, for example, posting content, but selling advertising, for example, for local business, Urbana businesses uh, on, the, on the site that you uh, put the content up? Yeah, so one thing that we've been uh, experimenting with in the last few years is underwriting sponsorships. Uh, and we've had a minimal amount of success for that, with that, and we plan to continue trying to sell more and more. But with that said, we, we realized that to really get a, a robust underwriting sponsorship program going, you almost need a full-time staff person, which is what you'll find at other channels. So we have to kind of balance our time with, hey, we're still going to program the channel, we're still going to produce videos. When do we have the spare time to do this? And we found some spare time to do this and had some, some success with it, but it's never going to be enough to fund a full-time position. But, but I, and I, I, 
I'm sorry, I haven't really looked at, at you know, this material, but do your underwriting sponsors actually get to post like an ad for their restaurant or their service station or whatever? It, you would think of it as an ad, but more along the PBS side yeah. of things. So you can't have any quantitative or qualitative language, but you can say this program has been made possible in part by so-and-so business. Well, Correct. I mean, I, I, maybe other people would have a different reaction. I think it would be okay to have a quantitative ad. It's or illegal. It's, it's, it's illegal. The FCC illegal. has a different opinion. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, well. Unfortunately. We go. Hey, uh, well, let's uh, write to our congressman and change the law. <laughs> <laughs> Bill and then Dennis. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is probably a good idea. It sounds good to me. I think, didn't it actually work like this before 1995? Because I remember taking a course through the cable company to be able to produce something with those old tube cameras, the big heavy things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was probably early 90s. So yeah, so, that's so that wasn't connected with the city at all then. It was not. At that time, the city didn't have a separate channel. None of the cities had public or education or government channels. The cable company ran a channel. That, it was Cablevision at the time was the name of the cable company. And they had a studio right you know, where Comcast be, yeah. is located right now, mm -hmm. and they had a studio there. When uh, that died off, I assume, I wasn't around then, but I wasn't here then. Um, that died off probably around the same time that the cities <coughs> brought on these channels. I mean, it seemed to work pretty good then. I don't know why, except it probably wasn't as, as organized and as easy to make things as it is now. I mean, no. they had to, you had to have quite a bit of production equipment and tapes and things like that. <laughs> Dennis. Well, uh, we all know that uh, uh, public access uh, content is very important to the city of Urbana. So um, I had some concerns about uh, surrendering it to a third party. Um, but uh, it sounds like it could be a reasonable financial move. And uh, we have a very creative field of uh, potential people who might come forward, I guess, uh, in the community who would like to take on the responsibility and the challenge of creating uh, and operating a fifth, a fifth channel for the community to, who has a diverse uh, need for uh, spokespersons and activities to be made available to the public. So I assume that you were going to be making a, a request for proposals, sort of a document. And I'm wondering if you could outline, or will we hear in the future, um, what requirements you're going to be looking for to those people who say that they're interested in having um, access to uh, public television production uh, and take the responsibility over. Uh, I guess that we would require what somewhat of a rigorous, rigorous um, um, portfolio of uh, background information, or are we just going to be kind of hoping that there's a young creative person graduating from the university that want, wants to like create something for us as far as a new or do they have to be a nonprofit? are you looking for a nonprofit organization i think we'd more look for an organization rather than an individual yeah. uh you know an individual is only one person and they you know they might work very hard and do that but once they're gone well then the channel goes with them essentially right. so we have an organization that's established there are some qualifications of what we might be looking for on uh, the top part of page three of your memo uh, significant involvement with the widest variety of community segments. We want this to be as diverse as the community is, which is one of the you know points of pride that UPTV has offered over the years. Interest and preferable experience in digital media of some sort. So it would be nice if they're you know familiar with media since they're going to be helping others create it, and a commitment to free speech and active representation of differing viewpoints, which has been a. a a, a key in what UPTV in the city provides. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, no action is required tonight. This was the first of several reports that you'll be getting, but we just wanted to get this information out there as soon as we could. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, the last item of business is under new business. It's ordinance number 2019-02-013, which is an ordinance approving a final subdivision plat from the Union Garden subdivision, plan case number 2364 S18. And I just wanted to note that we've reached another milestone for the first time since 2008. The City Council is considering a final plat which is establishing new residential lots. It's been 11 years. Um, so since it uh, has been a while since you've seen a final plat, I'll take just a minute to tell you what a final plat is if you'll indulge me. Um, so the final plat that's before you tonight for the Union Garden subdivision, what that does is really three main things. It locks in the lots, so the property lines for the individual lots. It shows the utilities and in particular the easements for those utilities so that should something go wrong with them, um, the appropriate people have access to them to fix them. And thirdly, and really important for this body, is that it dedicates the public right-of-way. So in this case, um, and let me see if I can... I think you'll probably have best luck looking at your packet versus the, um, the screen. But in this case, so the public right-of-way that the city of Urbana is uh, concerned with is that starts about here and it goes to Federal Drive. Um, that is the only piece of public right-of-way that is within the city of Urbana. So the other piece of Urbana, and I'm sorry, I assumed you all remembered this development, but I should take a step back. This is the one that spans Champaign and Urbana, north of Bradley, north of Carver Park and uh, Douglas, and starts uh, Champaign side here. This is um, 4th Street, if I can see correctly. Um, that's 5th there. Thank you very much, Charlie. 5th Street. Thank you. Um, so the parts that are in Urbana are this section here and this section here. And as I said, this is the, the part of the public right-of-way uh, that would be within the city of Urbana. So that is what a final plat does. This one in particular, as I, as I pointed out, the, the right-of-way here in Urbana, it extends here through Champaign. And this is also a new public right-of-way on the Champaign side there, but just for your uh, information. Um, other things uh, <coughs> that are laid out here in the final plat or where the um, detention basins are, where the sidewalks are, and as I mentioned, where the utilities are, um, and basically just gives you an idea on, on how those lots would be laid out. So the process here is that staff reviews this to ensure that it is compliant with our subdivision and land development code, and we have determined that it is. So we are asking for your approval tonight, and uh, a representative from Trinitas Development is here should there be any technical questions. Mary Alice. So thank you for that overview. It was really helpful. Um, I'm trying to figure out, you said that the sidewalks were on this document. Is that correct? I was trying to figure out where the sidewalks are. Well, well there's lots of numbers and so forth. I know, on. and that's why <laughs> I, I didn't, um, I didn't want to overwhelm you with details. So, um, I guess the sidewalks aren't technically shown, but along a public right-of-way, they are required, and I suppose we included the information that they are also being constructed along the private access drives as well, just so that you, you know that there is adequate pedestrian accommodation here. So, so. basically the right-of-way, the Urbana piece would be what looks like uh, just south of lot 102? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Charisse, what, what is track two, lot two? In that Urbana? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I'm just I'm looking. Okay, and then there's track one. So track one and track two are, are, are Urbana? Mm -hmm. or? So track two was the next recently. That's correct. And once, um, so when we use the term tracked, that is, um, that's usually the former designation. So once this final plat is approved and recorded, then we kind of get rid of calling them tracks and really complicated descriptions, and then we just call it Lot 102 of the Union Garden Subdivision. Okay, so Lot, I'm um, okay, Lot 10, I'm looking at, I guess, Lot 103, that's in Champaign. Um, right? So I might refer you I'm to, to the, <laughs> the most simple diagram is up in the top I left know, corner that really just kind of 
um, summarizes the lots where the lots are located. Mm -hmm. So uh, within the city of Urbana in its entirety are lots 103 mm -hmm. and lot 102. Lot 101, um, slightly inconveniently but not unprecedentedly, uh, okay. will be split between Urbana and Champaign because one of the primary uh, requirements for creating a lot is to have frontage along a public street. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was nearly impossible to do that uh, and still maintain the, the Urbana and the Champaign line. So uh, Lot 101 is split between the two communities, but as I said, that uh, is not unprecedented, and they have rearranged their site plans so that a building itself will not be splitting a line. So okay, and then Lot 102 and 103 are Those are all Urbana? entirely within Urbana, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I just get confused because it's behind Champaign property as well. And so uh, when I was trying to study this is like oh this is a lot it's of not dots. easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is a really complicated subdivision to, to be your first one in however many years it was <laughs> we never do anything <laughs> the simple way <laughs> but yeah congratulations on making it s this far so far um, I think Kevin was presenting this before did, did he give up <laughs> <laughs> uh, he has a sick family member today. Oh, so okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Conveniently. <laughs> so, um, I, I had the same question about sidewalks. I didn't see them on the preliminary plat, and since they are only required on right of way, um, and they're saying they're, and I believe they'll put them on the uh, access. Are we calling this access routes or parking lots? Um, depends on who you're asking. <laughs> The shaded areas are the private drives. They're either they, called they access routes or parking lots, right? Right. Um, technically, the zoning ordinance would consider them parking lots, but because that would be strange to name a parking lot, um, we are calling them private access drives for the purposes of Okay. Of this. So they're not shown on there. I was wondering if there were other drawings that came in with the <coughs> preliminary plat that showed where the sidewalks were going to be, anything like that? Well, during the discussions of, during the uh, lengthy discussions of the, of the site plan for this development, that was shown throughout, and I will confirm that is still the plan, yes, to have the sidewalks. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was reminded by our um, city administrator last week after the meeting that what we read in the memo, you can't really count on what, what's really important is what is in the ordinance and the attachments to the ordinance, so it would be, um, I don't know if we should put a condition on there or anything, but that's a concern. Um, secondly, I see there's going to be townhouses and duplexes, and the townhouses are defined in our zoning ordinance as single family. Um, I did not grab my zoning ordinance. It's setting right over there. It's, a, of course, a complicated definition that involves having a uh, single access to the exterior and probably some other criteria in there. Yeah, I have it. It's a uh, row house or townhouse building, or a row house or townhouse, a single family dwelling unit, part of a row house or townhouse building. Row house or townhouse building is a building containing a row of two or more single family dwelling units, each unit being separated from the adjoining units in each story by walls without openings, stuff like that. Um, so, and but there's no principal use in our in any of our R fours for townhouses. So, how what principal use is that? Um, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand your question. Well, in, in the R4 um, zoning um, category, there, it's not listed. There's no townhouse listing for principal use. So is it single family, multiple family, row oh, house? Oh, so thank you. Um, so because there would be more than three units on an individual lot, and as you can see, these are large lots, they are considered multifamily in terms of zoning designation because there's more than, um, excuse me, more than two, <laughs> more than two. If it was two or, if it was two units on a lot, it would be considered a duplex. If it was one unit on a lot, it'd be considered single family. So because there would be more than two units on an individual lot, zoning would consider it um, multifamily. Okay, so, in so terms they're multifamily. Like parking, that kind of thing. So I think I'd clarify things. I know uh, our architect on the plan commission was a little confused by that too. I think I'd clarify things if we called them townhouse-style apartments since they're multifamily instead of townhouses. Um, there's, there are legal definitions of townhouses both in our zoning ordinance and in our building ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're going to be pulling, pulling a building permit for a townhouse, that would be one thing, but it sounds like they're going to be pulling a building permit for multifamily. Mm -hmm. And I see a nod. So, so 
these are multifamily units. Um, so is a duplex a duplex, or is that multifamily too? Um, so in this instance, where they would have maybe three duplexes on a lot, that is also technically multifamily. So, um, and in other cases, the retreat, for instance, we did, uh, we were more consistent with that terminology in, in that we called them cottage style um, apartments or something like that. Or, um, okay, so, so that's uh, confusing too because our zoning ordinance defines multifamily as three or more dwelling units in a building. Um, so are they going to be pulling multifamily permits for that or are they going to be pulling duplex permits for that? Do you know? Uh, for the retreat? Uh, multi well, well for this that's, one that's the separate. Union Garden. <laughs> um, so building and zoning are entirely different in many in many instances so John is conveniently here should he need <laughs> to step in but uh, it's my understanding so if a building even if zoning calls it a multifamily the building code might consider it a duplex because they're more concerned with how it's built I'm more concerned with how many lots are on that property on or excuse me how many dwelling units are on that property so that's the distinction between zoning and building code okay. in terms so of you don't want to have to go to get a conditional use permit from the zoning board of appeals like you would if they were two duplexes on a r4 lot by themselves you'd have to it'd be non multifamily it'd be like putting a house in an apartment on the same lot you'd need a conditional use permit for that um, in some instances I know we changed uh, the language somewhat recently so that it uh, was a little it was a, it made a little bit more sense in that you didn't have to go for a conditional use permit to do anything um, yeah I think lot, section so. 5 3 in our zoning ordinance um, explains that if you had an actual duplex on a multifamily property on the same lot that's that's what this is about the platting so I want to make sure that if they meant to plat the duplexes separately and didn't want to go through that process but it sounds like maybe you've worked out something else um, so as far as the duplexes go, if they pull a duplex permit, um, are duplexes required to be sprinkled? Do we have sprinkling requirements for duplexes? Here comes John. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot a of these, a lot of this, it looks like a multifamily development and we do have sprinkling requirements for multifamily developments, right? For three or well, four. Well, in the three case or of a townhome, uh, townhouse construction, from the building perspective, we have a provision in our code that allows if you uh, install a, a minimum two-hour fire separation between the townhouse units, then sprinklers aren't required. But if the property owner decides they want to go ahead and do sprinklers, they can do both of those things. But the, at minimum, they have to have a two-hour separation. Okay. So I guess, um, see that the inconsistency is a little strange there because if they're going to pull duplex permits as a building permit, then it might make sense to have conditional uses because they might want to put the condition on that they'd have to have sprinklers or else, you know, uh, and I don't know what the separation requirements are. I know parking requirements for duplexes are different than multifamily. Duplexes aren't required to provide bicycle parking. They're required to provide fewer car spaces, things like that. So, but you're saying from a zoning perspective, they would still be required to provide parking spaces as if they were multifamily. Yes, that's correct. And that's because we are looking at the lot as a whole. So the lot as a whole might have 50 units on it. And so therefore, that's multifamily. And then there's the opportunity for parking sharing. So this duplex might not require the four spaces that the zoning ordinance would require. Uh, perhaps they require less, but maybe this one next door requires a little more, but they're all sharing one lot. And then therefore there's the ability to make sure that there's not more parking than is, than is necessary that's being built. Hmm. I do wish that building and zoning could be totally uh, on the same page, but that just isn't, uh, it isn't always practical. Okay, thanks. Dennis. And uh, as these are townhouses, um, uh, this is maybe nothing that you can answer, but would mail delivery be given to them individually as if there were homes, or would there be a central mail distribution? Um, I'll uh, just speak from my building. experience in dealing with this type of development in that um, typically it's my understanding the Postal Service does not do individual mail to this kind of a development, and it would do uh, grouped um, mailboxes. 
So I would imagine that's the case here. I don't know if the developer has any con has made contact yet with the Postal Service to uh, verify that, but. That's, that's true. Okay. All right. And then, um, but mail would be addressed to each individual address when each, each building or townhouse would have an address on the circle or the, the name street. Yes. Mm -hmm. John Schneider may have some more information on that. It, it may be, I'm thinking it may be a little more helpful. Um, when we do an inspection, uh, we issue, we might issue a permit for a duplex, but each one of those units would get a separate certificate of occupancy. So uh, we would issue a permit maybe for a row of, of uh, townhome type, you know, building with three or more. Each one of those units would get a separate certificate of occupancy. Mm -hmm. Each one of them have, have a unique address. And Lori's right, typically in a larger, the, the post office has gone to, no matter what kind of development it is, in larger developments with multiple units, they require a single station where people can, um, where they can drop off all the mail, then people have to stop and pick it up on their way in or way out. And then also these are leased or rented and they're not sold. That's my understanding, yes. More yeah. rental property. Mary Alice. Um, so if I remember correctly, when we were looking at this before, you were going, they were going to be built in stages. I'm looking at the developer back there in the, um, and that the items in, well, I'm going to call them tract one, those are going to be in like the second stage of the development. The reason I'm asking is because we're in the final stretch for the census here. Um, and so next year, I assume that they will not be built, so there won't be actual individuals living in tract one or tract two. Is that correct? Should we Could you come to the microphone, please? So I need to look at the tract numbers. So you're talking about tract one and tract two? Like Basically in Urbana. Okay, so the ones we, will, we will open the property August of 2020, and the units that okay. we anticipate right. opening at that time would be um, in tract one and tract three. Okay, but it's in the summer, so we missed the window for census. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Bill. Um, one more thing on the sidewalks. I remember that we had passed a um, complete streets policy back in 2011, but then when I looked up the policy, there's not much of a policy there. It says that the policy is that we would insert this thing in this comprehensive plan to make it as a two-year goal to um, to implement a complete streets policy in the subdivision code where it would actually take effect and have some teeth. I did a bicycle, a search for bicycle in the subdivision code and I got one hit in planned unit developments. So I don't think there's much been much done on that. Um, please stay tuned. Before you, within the next few months, will be a comprehensive overhaul of the subdivision ordinance uh, as well as an administrative document with all the technical details. Okay, and we have some really excellent planners right now that have a lot of knowledge on bicycle and pedestrian issues and could have some really good suggestions about um, lane markings and what kind of parking causes accidents. And Charlie could testify what kind of parking causes accidents. He <laughs> ran into a car that backed out in front of him about a year ago. So um, I think, you know, having those... That was, uh, I think it was indicated in 2011, that was before any of us, like, well, some of you were on council then, uh, that it was going to be a short-term goal of two years, so we're about mm, seven it's or eight years. It's a comprehensive passing. rewrite of a very large, uh, complicated document, so it took us a little longer than two years. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Eric. Uh, just as long as you're, you know, making things over, I have never understood the prohibition against backing into a parking space. And I'm thinking about Charlie's accident. If that person had been moving forward out of the parking space, probably would have seen Charlie coming. So I wonder if, as we're thinking about these variety of things with respect to bicycles, pedestrians, uh, and things that affect them, if we could consider that. Um, I might need to throw that into your court because I think that is a public um, policy, not necessarily one that's put on developers. But and you're not the first person who's raised this issue, but before us tonight is this subdivision plat, yes. so we yes, need sir. to focus on that. <laughs> but but, yes, um, but <laughs> believe me, the public has raised that issue as well, so we will, we can deal with that on another night. 
Mary Alice. I'd like to move ordinance number 2019-02013, an ordinance approving a final subdivision plat, Union Garden subdivision, plan case number 2364-S18 uh, for approval. I'll second. Moved by Mary Alice, second by Dean. This requires a five-eighths vote of the, uh, yes. Again, you'll have to edit this. Uh, to insert corporate authorities rather than city council. It's already there. It's already there. It's already there. Is that in section two, Jim? I thought that's what that says. It's an affirmative vote of the members of the corporate authorities then holding yeah. office. What I have is now therefore be it ordained by the city council on the first page of the ordinance. Unless it's, I have an older draft. So it should read by the corporate no, authorities? No, yes. No. Okay. Mayor? Yes. Um, the way that uh, we've defined city council for the purposes of these resolutions and ordinances includes uh, whatever definition is needed in the ordinance itself. There's uh, some, I've uh, gone over this with Kurt uh, to some extent of how city council is defined. And, and so all of our ordinances just say passed by the city council, and then we have the uh, vote of the corporate authorities as it's appropriate. Um, okay. So th that's been the, the way we've done things. If we want to change the templates, well, we'll we, we could do that. All right, but uh, uh, Illinois Municipal Code uh, requires this vote to be a by corporate authorities. Right, and that's what it says that's in the, says. that last section there. This ordinance is hereby passed by the affirmative vote of the members of the corporate authorities then holding office. So that should suffice? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, we need five out of eight. Any further discussion? <laughs> All right, will the clerk please call the roll? City Council Members Brown? No. Hazen? Yes. Hersey? Abstain. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. Wu? Yes. Mayor Marlin? Yes. That motion passes. With no further business before this council, this meeting is adjourned.